All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Mitch Steele. I'm the brewmaster and co-founder at New Realm Brewing Company, and I'm here to help um, moderate this discussion that I'm pretty excited about today. Um, everybody on this screen here um, is a member of the Brewing Association Technical Committee, and the Brewers Association is an organization that represents small, independent, craft brewers. Over 5,000 brewers are represented by the Brewers Association in the United States, and most of those breweries are around 500 barrels a year. So we we often, when we're in our, our groups and working groups, we talk, um, we talk a lot about making sure our audience and the membership of the Brewers Association is represented in what we try to do. And one of the big, big things we do at the Brewers Association is uh, we have a technical committee and the technical committee has six subcommittees and five of them are represented here today. So the subcommittees in the technical committee uh, are safety, maintenance and engineering, supply chain, sustainability, draft beer quality and quality. And each one of us is a chair or co-chair of one of those subcommittees. And we do a lot of work to present information to the membership, provide be best practices, recommendations in the ever-changing, fast-moving environment that is craft beer. So um, with that, you know, what we, what we thought we would do is just allow uh, everybody representing their subcommittee to speak a little bit about some things they feel are important for people to know if they're running a brewery and also point out some resources that are uh, available to uh, those of you that belong to the Brewers Association. So, um, yeah, I guess uh, with that, I'll I'll go ahead and, and turn it over. Um, and um we're going to start off with safety. And one thing I will say before Zach gets into this is one of the best practices I've had in my career is anytime you have a meeting with your team, your production team, always start with safety. Talk safety first. Keep it first and foremost, front of mind. Uh, it is the most important thing we all do is keep our team safe. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to Zach now and let him talk about some of the work that the uh, safety subcommittee is doing. Thanks, Mitch. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Zach Perot. I'm the general manager for Untold Brewing on the South Shore of Massachusetts. And then I'm also the co-chair of the safety committee. Uh, a little background on me. I got my start with safety in high school, my high school job reviewing our safety data sheets binder. So I got kind of the bug early on. And then I got my brewing industry start um, at a small brewery running their packaging, warehouse, and facilities departments. So it was a small place and wearing many hats, as a lot of people do. Um, today, I just wanted to kind of cover some things that we do working with OSHA, um, why safety should be important to you, how to improve your safety program, and then kind of what resources we got that can help you out along the way. Uh, in addition to creating resources, the Safety Committee works pretty closely with OSHA to inform our members of any policy changes that are happening. So every year there's usually new emphasis programs and then some tweaks to verbiage here and there that can affect the brewing industry. Um, and then in addition to that, we also advocate on the brewing industry's behalf with OSHA. All the times OSHA is seen as the enemy, but they really just exist to keep everybody safe and they are also broken into both the enforcement and the compliance side. The compliance side doesn't actually issue any penalties and they only exist to give guidance to businesses, both breweries and others. Um, they have a bunch of great resources through their website to help you understand their rules and regulations, how to comply with their minimum requirements for safety. And then they also have some great things that any brewery can take advantage of, like their um, program that's a free consultation where a representative can come out, walk through your brewery, and tell you what you need to fix without you guys having to fear getting fines from the visit. So that's some, some stuff that we do with OSHA and what OSHA does for you. And then talking about safety a little bit here, um, safety is best defined as a freedom from harm. So our brewing industry is super fun, it's exciting, it's rewarding work, but it's also extremely hazardous. Everyday employees 
face dozens of chemical, physical, and biological hazards that can lead to both acute and chronic injuries. So those listening, take a moment and think about what would happen at your brewery if you couldn't work for two full weeks. It's about 10 days is the average time away from work from a workplace incident. Um, it doesn't matter if you make the best beer in town if your team can't work. Safety does require extra consideration and focus, but the extra effort's worth it to make sure everyone goes home unharmed every day. There are some additional costs to being unsafe beyond just worrying about your worker comp insurance and rescheduling issues. When you have recurring safety incidents, this lowers employee morale and can increase turnover at your workplace. Also, chronic injuries tend to reduce productivity and increase employee burnout. In general, it costs about 30% of an employee's salary to replace them, plus your time investment for hiring and training. Investing in safety can lower expenses in the long term, and it also shows your employees that you care about them and value them. Um, brewery owners and managers, especially at smaller operations, always have hundreds of things demanding their attention at every moment. Safety can often seem daunting and usually gets pushed to the back burner in a lot of places, but it's important to remember that safety is a process and no brewery has a perfect safety program. Any improvement that you make, no matter how small, is always a step in the right direction. Just like any other project, it's important to break it down into smaller tasks and try and dedicate an hour or two each week to work on it. Some of the resources that the Brewers Association has include things like Matt Stinchfield, um, our former Brewer Association ambassador. It's a copy of his book, it's called Brewing Safety. Um, it is a fantastic resource um, that breaks down safety into an easy follow guide that brings you through every aspect of the brewery. Another really great starting resource that I want to talk about is the Hazard Assessment Principles Guide found on our Brewers Association website. Um, overview, a hazard, a hazard assessment is a step-by-step -step analysis of a process such as dry hopping or keg cleaning. And then during that assessment, you identify and rank the hazards involved. The ranking helps you determine what things in your brewery are more dangerous than others, so you know what to focus on first. And then the assessment itself lays the framework for writing good standard operating procedures. And then the guide on the Brewers Association website also includes templates for both the hazard assessment and SOP forms. It's also important to remember when you're doing an assessment to involve people who are actually doing the tasks. This helps invest your employees in safety and safety culture, and it also gives you additional points of view to write a better process. Once you've identified hazards, there are a bunch of other resources on the website that you can utilize. Some to highlight are five steps to prevent ladder injuries, don't let heat stress you out, and our six pack of safety resources. The Brewers Association provides free access to all of our safety resources for everyone, not just the BA members. And kind of the final step in an assessment is to eliminate or substitute hazards if possible. It's not always going to be possible, so there are also preventative and protective controls that you can implement. Um, these controls can either be administrative or engineered. With that, I'm going to toss it over to Ken to talk about some maintenance and engineering. My name is Kent Taylor. <clears throat> I'm the co-founder of Blackstone Brewing Company in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, we have been making craft beer in Nashville for almost 30 years. So um, the thing that, that and, and I'm the, the, the um, co-chair of the maintenance and engineering subcommittee uh, with the BA uh, in the one would think that I have an engineering degree, which I do not. Um, what I have is 30 years worth of mistakes and <laughs> figured out how to do them correctly. Um, and and it, it, so some of the things that it, we basically um, deal with anything that we, or we deal with stuff um, as opposed to procedures or how to, um, so, it, you know, if it's a physical thing in, in a brewery, then 
then that's that's what we deal with the maintenance and engineering of the, of stuff. Um, some of the the uh, engineering papers that we have uh, released, and these are available on the uh, uh, Brewers Association website. Um, uh, we did uh, have done one on on brewery steam boilers, uh, process hoses and piping, yeast handling. Uh, clarification systems, uh, quality brew labs, uh, side streaming is one that, that should be up there uh, fairly soon. We're working on a paper with for liquid chillers, uh, for pressure vessels, and and one of the the one that I real that I feel really passionate about, and one that that we've actually the the subcommittee has been working on for probably almost four years, is kettle boil over, um, and it has been my experience that, that many breweries and, and ours included, we, we ran a brew pub for 20 years and that brewing system did not have any boil over protection. And there were regular boil overs where people were in and around hot work coming out of a kettle. Um, and if I had known at the time that, that the devices for, for shutting off your heat to the kettle were as inexpensive and easy to install we would have done this years ago. And that, so we've kind of picked up the mantle to, to try to get this, this out uh, for, for folks to be aware that, that the, the fix is, is, or not the fix, but the, the ability to, to have a, have a fail safe cutoff is, is fairly inexpensive um, and fairly easy to install. And it, what this has led to is, um, we created a uh, what I call a box, which is a control box that that can be retrofit, and uh, with a sensor that, that's put into the um, into the kettle. And there's a picture uh, that we're going to flash up on screen, and I'll talk a little bit about it. So this is this is the control box, and and I'm an accountant by trade, and and this accountant actually built that box. So if that's any indication, if I can do it, you can do it. It's just not that hard. Um, and, and what this does is it, it's, it stands in between um, your, uh, the, the power that, that, that provides the heat and the, the boil or boil over. Um, so, and, and, and then we'll, um, there will be a, a link. I have a complete build list and, and that, and it'll be provided in a link uh, down in the, um, in the section uh, below. So let's, let's get rid of this. And I, I want to show that something else. I think I can show it on screen here. So this is a, this is an example of the actual probe, whether you can see it or not, but um, that, that actually gets installed into your kettle. And when, when, when uh, the the boiling work hits this, that's what triggers uh, that that outside box to to cut off of the the, the electricity. Something else. There's a link in your uh, in, down in the notes to a podcast that was done by uh, Carrie Caldwell Bloxham, uh, where she was uh, severely injured in a boil over uh, several years ago. And I had run into this shortly after she had had recovered from from her burns, and at the point that that this was done, it was fairly soon after this that it was still very raw. And I challenge anybody out there that has a kettle without boil over protection to listen to her podcast and not go out and and. Uh, put this together and retrofit your kettles to stop this. The cost of this is, is right at a thousand dollars, which to me just is nothing in compared to the, the cost and heartache of somebody getting hurt. So that, I, that's a, a soapbox that I've been on recently. And, and these are the kind of things um, that the maintenance and engineering subcommittee uh, takes up and tries to push. So, we will now pass this, and I don't remember who's coming next. That would be me. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, so thanks, Kent and, and Zach, for um, uh, your overviews of what you guys are doing. You, you, you know, I think you, you get the gist of this, that that uh, safety and 
uh, equipment design are very closely intertwined. And, uh, you know, and that might be a good place to ask some questions, I think, as we move forward. Um, so once again, uh, my name is Mitch Steele. I am the chair of the supply chain subcommittee. And I took that position, I want to say it was about five years ago. And um and I remember, uh, I remember talking to Larry about it, and I thought, well, you know, this sounds great. You know, we can provide some resources for the the membership and and get some best practice documents out. And about you know a year and a half, two years into it, we hit COVID, and everything changed. And uh, you know, and now you know, supply chain is this buzzword and takes the blame for every problem that breweries have. And rightfully so. I'm not. I'm not making uh, light of the supply chain issues that breweries have because it's absolutely critical uh, to the success of your business. I think um, you know one of the things uh, that we have done, and and we'll we'll get the link out to everybody who's listening here. Uh, and and this is by necessity. We have decided to publish quarterly updates on supply chain, um, and and some. Some quarters it's uneventful, you know, and there's not a heck of a lot going on. But I will tell you that summer and fall usually are loaded with information, and uh, we are getting updates all the time. Uh, Chuck Skypeck, who runs the technical division of the Brewers Association, is also a member of several ingredient industry associations and is really dialed into the latest developments in in ingredient quality and supply. Uh, and, and so are most of the members of the subcommittee. And so I'll give you a couple quick updates just so you can see the kind of stuff that we're working on. Uh, we put out the quarterly update in, um, I believe it was mid-July, it was published. And a week later, it was out of date. Um, you know, the, the, several things are going on and, and, and supply chain is impacted by so many worldwide events. It's, it's just staggering. But the war in Ukraine uh, with Russia. And when Russia pulled out of the deal to allow the Ukraine to ship grain across the Black Sea and prohibited that, um, that impacted malt and wheat prices or wheat and barley prices and it, in, incredibly. And I will say from a personal level, we were in the middle of contracting our malt needs for next year. And the suppliers went radio silent on us. Um, and, you know, and we thought we were going to get, you know, some pretty good deals this year after last year when the prices went up a lot. And everything just kind of came to a screeching halt in that process. And part of it was this was this political situation in Europe and in, with Russia and Ukraine. And then the other uh, the other thing that's going on is is the upper Midwest portion of the United States is having uh, a horrible summer as far as rainfall, just not getting any. And, and so um, I think what we are going to try and do is put out another update next week. Uh, there have been some industry conferences this past week, and, and we're going to get some updates from them and, and share them with everybody. But, you know, and, and um, the other thing, uh, you know, I wanted to talk about is hops. And hops, we had, uh, we thought it was a promising start to the growing season, uh, and we indicated that in our um, <clears throat> in our update. But you know, the plantings have gone down. The hop suppliers are sitting on huge surpluses of hops right now, and so they're pulling hop yards, um, and they have reduced. Uh, I forget the number, it was floating around 8% of all the planning in the United States has been taken out for this year, just because they're sitting on record level surpluses in their warehouses. And hop suppliers that have storage charges in their contracts, but have never actually followed through on that with brewers are now following through with it. They want to get those hops out of their warehouses. Um, <clears throat> but we thought the growing season was off to a good start. And then uh, we had a warm spring and then a cold snap that is apparently impacting the early ripening varieties. And, and one of the key varieties that would be in that category is Centennial, which is in the top five of planted acreage in the, in the United States. So it's a very popular hop and, and a big concern. Um, the other, another ingredient that we wanted to talk about is CO2. 
And there have been, for the past couple of years, regional shortages and allocations and rationing of CO2 to breweries. And there's a lot of things contributing to that. Number one is the usage of CO2 goes up in the summer uh, with all the... Um, uh, the fruit harvesting, they use a lot of dry ice and, and that really sucks up a lot of the CO2 winery. Uh, you know, we've seen a lot of problems out in Northern California with, the, with the wineries using a lot of dry ice during harvest. Um, and, you know, interestingly enough, you know, throughout this whole shortage, we learned quite a bit about where CO2 comes from. Uh, and, you know, it's it's highly dependent on the fuel industry, which is why we first started seeing shortages during COVID. Nobody was drying, driving. All the ethanol plants in the Midwest shut down, and the ethanol fermentation for fuel and for grain-neutral spirits is what produces a lot of the CO2 that gets refined into beverage-grade CO2. So, um, you know, that whole impact of COVID and the national shutdown and nobody on the roads really screwed up the brewery's supply chain for CO2. And, you know, one of the other major sources of CO2 is fertilizer plants. And, um, you know, last summer we had some situations where fertilizer plants had planned maintenance shutdowns and stopped producing CO2. Um, you know, and the demand is going up. The cannabis industry uses a lot of CO2. Um, there's a lot of things going on. It's a very complex supply chain. It's not just a matter of going into a mine and pulling out CO2, which is what I thought it was before this all started. Uh, there's a lot of interdependencies with other industries and, and things can really impact that. So my advice would be if, if you don't have a contract for CO2, you might want to, might want to start thinking about getting a contract, um, Earlier this year, we, the Supply Chain Subcommittee, put out a, a series of best practice guides for contracting ingredients, and you should check those out if you get a chance. But we covered malt, hops, uh, aluminum cans, CO2, um, specialty ingredients, herbs and spices, you know, all sorts of things are covered in those contracting best practices. And, you know, a lot of people are brewing with fruit right now. You know, fruit is something that can be contracted. And I don't know if it, brewers really realize that. I, I think most of us just call, you know, one of the suppliers and say, hey, I need some peach extract and I need it next week. But, you know, there are supply chain issues with fruit as well. I know um, uh, in Georgia, the we had a similar situation with the spring weather that really damaged the uh, peach crop this year. So, you know, it's 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 fascinating to learn about all this kind of stuff. And one of the things that we try to do is is get that information out there for people so that they understand the things they need to be thinking about when they're running their brewery. Um, and I think that's it for me. Um, and up next, uh, Adam with uh, sustainability. Yeah. Thank you, Mitch. Appreciate it. Um, yes, my name is Adam Beecham. I'm one of the co-founders and the chief production officer at Creature Comforts Brewing Company, also in Georgia here. Um, and um, I don't know, uh, I'm I'm the uh, co-chair of the sustainability subcommittee. Um, so sustainability has been sort of a side passion of mine since college. Uh, I was in the life sciences um, was my primary route and then took so many ecology electives. They told me I could get another major. So it's always been sort of a component of things that I've done during my career and happy to be, uh, have the opportunity to do that with the BA, uh, over the last few years, being a member of this subcommittee and, uh, more recently, uh, co-chair. So, um, really, um, you know, important work for me, um, the, you know, the purpose, the stated purpose of this subcommittee is uh, to help BA members operate more efficiently. Uh, we want to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to mitigate the worst impacts of climate change and increase operational resiliency for member breweries. So, you know, a lot of sort of knock on benefits to being sustainable um, exist for your businesses. So customers super appreciate it. In general, I think, uh, you know, particularly younger demographics these days are really appreciating uh, companies that do the right thing uh, when it comes to a whole host of issues and, um, you know, sustainability being one of the top issues. Um, it helps your bottom line is the other piece. You, you know, even if you are a full tilt climate denier, uh, there's no denying that using less inputs to make the same unit of beer 
um, is, uh, is good for the business. So, um, it's, uh, there, there are lots of reasons to think about this stuff. And, and one of them is really, as I'll talk about later, um, there are probably things that you can do in your operation that you just haven't thought of yet that are really simple and probably free, um, that can do better for the environment and for your bottom line. So, um, we try to try to help small brewers in particular, find those simple, easy, cheap solutions uh, has been a real focus of ours over the last little bit. Um, you know, just uh, some of the ways that manifests, uh, the ways that we can help. Um, we do have an incredibly talented and accomplished group of people that have higher achievements than I do in the fields of sustainability um, that are actually experts, whereas I'm, I'm really a brewer. Um, but they always have their antenna up uh, for things that are coming down the pipe. Um, for example, we posted something recently about some recyclability issues of some of the uh, the labels that are pressure sensitive, or some of the um, the wrapped labels that you know we felt members should be aware of um, that might you know cause issues with their municipal recycling facilities. We we're able to get information like that out to members. Um, when you know Mitch was alluding to uh, CO2, you know, and the great work that the supply chain subcommittee did. Um, during some of those really intense shortages during some of the darkest days of the pandemic, um, we were able to sort of come in with a document that we had mostly done and just updated with how brewers can be more efficient with their CO2 usage. So try to get timely materials out like that when, when we feel like membership really needs it, we can be pretty quick and um, pivot and uh, produce valuable resources. Um, so we do a lot of that and we have a really good varied group of, of differently skilled people that contribute to that. Uh, but we also have some pretty large sort of marquee projects um, that have, you know, taken resources, money, time uh, to develop that we think are, are just really critically important. Um, the most recent one that we published is called the Water Risk Assessment Tool. Um, so this was a, was a really expensive project that the BA paid for uh, <laughs> that was complicated, but we were able to bring on a really good partner, uh, this group called the Antia Group who are experts in assessing uh, water risk, uh, availability, um, a host of other things, quality. Um, and so we actually worked with them uh, and sourced uh, data from a couple of different databases and uh, pulled together a report for every single member brewery. Um, at the time during 2022, that was 5,832 breweries um, who individually have a report that goes into extreme detail about what sort of risks they have with their local uh, water service. Um, so that goes, you know, everything from just an outright business risk to quantity supply limitations, uh, the quality of your watershed, the uh, municipal infrastructure that you're on, um, any regulatory or governance sort of risks or reputational risks that you might have um, with regard to the way that you consume or, or dispose of wastewater. Um, so um, if you were not a member at that time uh, during the end of 2022, you can just look up a brewery that's like right next to you and it'll probably be all the way accurate, um, but just wanted to highlight that. Um, it's something that you should understand, uh, even if there's not a heck of a lot you could do about it. Oftentimes there are things you can do about it, you know, being an advocate, getting to know your municipality, um, perhaps envisioning equipment for filtration if you have quality risks, et cetera. Um, so there, there are uh, resources within the tool to uh, take next steps as well, which I think is uh, is a real value. So um, certainly check that out. You know, it's, it's people don't like to think of the big scary things sometimes, but um, I'm I'm one that really likes to appreciate and understand the risks that I have. Um, so so that was a big one for us. We really want to um, to drive people to that. The other really marquee tool that we have is called the Sustainability Benchmarking Tool. Um, and the way that I think about this tool, it's it's a little bit of an on-ramp into thinking about becoming more efficient as a brewing operation. Uh, the first step is really understanding where you stand. Um, and so, you know, we, you know, all brewers have purpose behind what they're doing. Um, I found that uh, I was often as a brewer focused on quality and efficiency was somewhat of an afterthought. Um, and so, you know, we had some wasteful practices when we first started looking at this stuff, year two, three, four, um, started plugging in our utility bills into this tool, uh, which is how it works. It's a Excel based tool, um, that aggregates a bunch of data from your peer breweries, um, in your size class. So, um, 
we started putting our data in and then we get this report that spits out, here's how you rank amongst breweries uh, that are similar to you in size. And you can see really quickly the areas that you do very well at or you know middling or the areas where you have a lot of room for improvement. Um, so it can direct your attention into areas that probably have that cheap, low hanging fruit that maybe just a simple process change. Maybe you're well into overkill territory on something that is just a needless use. Uh, for, for us, again, going back to CO2, um, we uh, you know discovered that 18 pounds per barrel of uh, CO2 usage is pretty abysmal uh, when it comes to uh, breweries that are our size. So we set out, you know, we actually use another BA resource and the, uh, the tool uh, that, you know, it's not a tool, it's, it's just a guide to CO2 usage and being efficient and bought an inexpensive leak detector and found some really significant leaks and uh, among a few other things. So the benchmarking tool is a really incredible way to just orient yourself and how well you're doing uh, in natural gas and energy and, and wastewater costs and CO2 uh, and solid waste as well. So highly recommend uh, just, it's a pretty quick thing to put your util utility bills into that thing and submit your data. It also serves as a survey piece for the BA to collect and aggregate that data anonymously um, provided to the peers. So um, can't say enough about the value of that tool. It's saved my business a whole lot of money and uh, really put things into perspective for us. Um, additionally, we have a lot of really excellently produced manuals uh, for sustainability, uh, just sort of best practices guides. They're usually in the range of like 40 or 50 pages, so it's a lot of principles, um, but just things to know if you are, for example, designing a brewery. Um, so there's a whole manual on sustainable design and building strategies. Um, there's an entire manual on energy sustainability, how to think about energy uh, within a brewery. There's one for solid waste reduction, and there's a whole manual for water and, uh, and a whole manual for wastewater as well. Um, so those are all incredibly valuable, somewhat timeless resources uh, that we are, you know, tweaking uh, every every several years, but um, but really just incredibly valuable. And then finally, just want to point folks, um, one that we recently came out with is simple, um, but I've kind of struggled to um, to find a good tool, a tool that does it better, a brew house efficiency tool that we just published. So this takes uh, the coarse ground extra extract from your supplier and uh, builds out, you can build out a recipe for all of your brands and get a really precise and accurate level of uh, efficiency calculation um, that you can track over time and just look at, you know, where are you lo losing those precious sugars uh, during your process and, and how, how well is your wool pole working at troop separation. So um, I just commissioned a brewery out in Los Angeles and it's one of the first things I turned over to them, you know, day one brew day, you're looking at how efficient you are in the brew house and the tool was invaluable for us last week. So um, those are just some of the highlights. Um, you know, th this whole group, the technical subcommittee produces an amazing amount of really, really valuable stuff for people that do this for a living. And I, I just can't say enough about it. It's once, once you discover it, it's just a rabbit hole of amazing, valuable things. So you should look at it. And I'm going to pass it over to uh, Mr. Larry Horitz. Take us home. There. Thanks, Adam. Um, I, I wanted to take just a second to, to tell the people who are watching that everybody that you're seeing on the screen today is a volunteer. Um, I think that a lot of people don't understand exactly what the Brewers Association, which is technically a professional trade association, how it really works, right? I mean, obviously there is a, a very talented and paid professional staff in that organization that helps administer uh, uh, the group. Um, but most of the information that you're seeing presented here is either come from volunteers or occasionally third party staffers who this, uh, this group of volunteers and, and hundreds of others, I, I believe right now, there are somewhere around 200 people serving in total tech and tech subs. Mitch, does that number sound right? Yeah, it sounds right. Yeah, there's an enormous amount of uh, volunteer labor from your peers, frankly. It's one of my favorite things about this industry, right? Like, while we all technically compete, we pretty much go to, in a direction together. Uh, and I, I think that's amazing. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, two uh, of the subcommittees today, uh, Mr. Perkins and uh, the group from Quality uh, weren't able to join us, so I'm going to talk a little bit about Quality 
and I am currently the chair of the uh, subcommittee for draft beer quality. Um, but I wanted to start uh, by showing something that uh, that we haven't looked at before. Hang on, let me get right here. This is going to get us where we need to go, I think. Um, if you uh, log in or sign on to the Brewers Association website, you're going to see uh, a little button right here called Resource Hub. Almost all of the resources that we're talking about today uh, exist on that hub. Um, and if you click through it, you're going to see pretty much every subcommittee's uh, material up here. And there are, it used to be hundreds. We may be up to thousands of, uh, of unique tools and documents um, that, are, uh, that are available for you to use in your brewery, right? Um, so let me tell you just a little bit about the two uh, subcommittees that I'm going to uh, represent today. I'll start with quality. Um, uh, by the way, almost all of these came out of a small group, uh, maybe at this point 20 years ago, started by uh, Ken Grossman and Chuck Skypeck that used to be called Pipeline. Um, and, and right now the technical uh, committee and its subcommittees have one of the largest budgets anywhere inside of the organization. So it always cracks me up when people are like, I'm not sure what the Brewers Association does with my dues. I'm like, well, they spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on the resources that we're talking about today. So in addition to all the volunteer labor, there's actually money going into that. We sponsor, uh, we have sponsored research, a lot of it over the years. And of course, individual studies like uh, the gentleman on this call have talked about. All right. So let's talk about the quality subcommittee. I think we would all argue that uh, quality is super important for our segment of the industry. Uh, there are a total of 19 members serving at the moment, uh, as well as a couple of ad hoc groups and, and a few third party uh, service providers. The quality subcommittees membership is, is trying to help uh, members of the trade association. And for that matter, other people in the in industry produce consistent high quality beer, right? I think, um, those of us who have been around for a while have understood that one of the threats that many of us perceive to our industry are industry players making relatively low quality beer. Um, I'm not going to dime anybody, anybody out on that. You all know who you think uh, probably needs some improvement. And I, I'm uh, not ashamed to say that at, at different times in my career, it's been breweries I've worked for. And this group is putting out flavor best practices, uh, uh, all kinds of information about yeast health and fermentation management and raw good selection. We don't really have the time to dig too deep. I think uh, I, I did a quick graze this afternoon over the over 210 unique tools that are available. And I think if you've got a problem in your brewery and you're not looking for it on the Brewers Association website, then you're missing an opportunity for sure. Um, that is a group that uh, has a mission that I think is near and dear to everybody's heart. And I also want to remind everybody that Mitch said that, you know, most of our resources are targeted at very small breweries. It's interesting to think about the idea that most of the tiny breweries in America, and I'm talking about the 5,000 or so breweries that are five, six, 700 barrels, they just don't have the resources to pull together some of the information that we're going to provide to you for, for a relatively small amount of dues, right? Um, uh, or a relatively low price for dues. Um, please check out the resource hub for that. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the draft beer quality subcommittee. So DBQ started as an ad hoc group um, that was uh, pulling together industry members, not just from craft, but also from the major players. And I think it was a really important nexus of thought around draft beer. You know, there are large breweries out there and even medium sized regional specialty breweries that have teams of people who just work on draft beer quality. But I thought this was a great cross industry initiative that's, that we all like safety, which is really, I think, open source and pre-competitive for all of us, including the large brewers. We said, listen, the delivery of high quality, safe, uh, flavorful draft beer to customers is important to every single brewery in America. And that should also be somewhat pre-competitive. So I encourage you to check out the manual. Um, it is available in its entirety on the internet digitally, uh, can be bought through Brewers Publications 
uh, division of the BA for a relatively small amount of money. If you show up at one of the trade shows, uh, and I think even at the Great American Beer Festival, you can probably score a free copy if you politely poke around. Um, they tend to get left in uh, presentation rooms kind of on purpose by people like me. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we, we also publish resources for uh, draft beer retailers, right? I mean, I think we're all, uh, none of us is under the illusion that we can control the quality of our draft beer once it hits the retailer. They really have to care about how their lines are cared for. Um, and even in states where it's legally required that they're cleaned on some sort of frequency interval, I think we all know that that's probably not the standard that we should be following. You know, I've definitely uh, visited retail accounts and asked about the cleanliness of the draft lines and had a bartender show me a chart and said, look, they, they checked the box. They must be clean, right? Um, so again, all of those resources can be found on the hub, uh, including uh, best practices for uh, retailers and for people in your own brewery. Uh, we also recently released a, a tool about draft beer cleaning safety, which I think is really important. Um, while all of us represent uh, different subcommittees on the technical committee, we try very hard as a group to not be siloed, to break the walls down between us. So you heard Kent uh, and, and Zach specifically talking about how those two subcommittees have collaborated around safety for boil overs. Uh, obviously Kent and his group is focused on the engineering and the parts of the bits and nibs. And Zach is focused on the hazard assessment and how to communicate that information and get people to actually use those tools. Um, obviously this panel is partly uh, proselytization and outreach, right? We want you to be a part of our group so that we can help you make better, safer beer. Um, and that's, those are the, the two subcommittees that I'm going to represent today. And uh, that's really all I've got other than to say that the, the, the meat of our stuff is on the BA website. I will say that there is a paywall there. Um, so you got to be a member. If you're a very small brewery, there are extremely competitive rates. I'm going to sell for about 2.8 seconds here because all, <laughs> none of us would be able to do the volunteer work we're doing if there wasn't a extreme, an extremely talented professional staff at the BA. Um, most of us work with Chuck Skypack and, uh, and a few of, uh, his colleagues, and your dues pay their salaries so that our hundreds of hours of volunteer work can benefit your brewery. So with that, I'll give it back to Mitch and uh, and hang out for questions. Yeah, thanks, Larry. And and yeah, a couple of things I wanted to bring up, you know, in, in light of the uh, conversations from everybody, you know, the, the technical committee, even though there are separate subcommittees, uh, to Larry's point, we do work together a lot. And a lot of our projects require resources from multiple subcommittees. So, um, you know, it's, it's a really important dynamic of, of the technical committee of the BA. And every year we get together, or every two years rather, we get together and brainstorm what do we need to be working on? What are the priorities for the industry that we can help with and come up with a, a laundry list of ideas? And a lot of that comes from you know, from members of the technical committee, but we also go out and canvas people we know in the industry in our states, our regions, and ask them, what do they need from, from a resource perspective? So, you know, if, um, you know, if you ever have, uh, you see a need or you see an opportunity, um, please, uh, you know, reach out to somebody in one of these subcommittees and and see if we can get it on the docket because uh, we value that kind of input for sure. Um, one of the things I missed talking about is, as far as supply chain uh, was all the work that we do funding uh, uh, breeding programs for ingredients. And, uh, you know, we're uh, big believers in, in public hop breeding. Uh, and, you know, it's really important because, you know, public varieties have been kind of the anchor of the hop industry in the United States for a long time. And over the past 20 years, there have been a lot of private breeding programs that have opened up. But, you know, with a private breeding program, you know, the hops are great, but they're not always made accessible to growers everywhere. And so sometimes the supply of, of those varieties is either, you know, it, it can be in short supply and there's a large demand for them. So, um, you know, we've consciously made the effort to fund a lot of breeding programs. And I know Chuck Skypeck, who we've mentioned a couple of times, is is uh, 
very active in hop industry groups and, and, you know, the hop research council and things like that. So, uh, you know, that's an important part of what we do as well in supply chain. Um, I want to open it up to our group to ask each other questions, um, if, if that works for everybody. And one of the things I wanted to uh, ask Zach, a uh, safety related question, um, can you talk a little bit about the minimum requirements for employee training on safety? What, what does every brewery need to do to be compliant with a safety program? Sure. Um, so there, there's going to be broken up by your uh, employee numbers, um, but almost everyone's going to fall into the OSHA um, requirements. So a, a big one that a lot of people miss is um documentation so it's not just doing the work but showing someone that you did it osha likes to say if you can't if you don't have it written it down you didn't do it um and like the the basic one that a lot of people have to do is going to be the 300 log so osha's got this pretty simple form um about employee injuries and then you log it and then you send it to them once a year if you whether you have something on it or not um and going back to Matt Stinchfield's new book, Brewery Safety, he really lays out what you have to do um, by like different tiers, how big your brewery is, you know, how many decibels is your machine, if you need a hearing program or not. Um, but kind of minimum standards are going to be those more basic level um, documentation. Um, so I, I would definitely look into that. That's also where OSHA is going to get you all the time. Um, so especially smaller guys out there and it also keeps it in your head all the time. If you know that you got to write something down, then you sure you're thinking about safety. Well, Zach, one of the things that, you know, uh, in a former life, I was the chair of the safety subcommittee. So uh, one of the things we used to talk about a lot with small, very small breweries uh, where people are like, well, I'm, cer I'm certainly too small to, to fall underneath these regulations. It's like, there, I think there are really two important things about that. One of them is, you know, do you really want to be exempt from protecting your employees from harm? Right. <laughs> like that's, I don't think that's a really great look. Uh, I know it's difficult and expensive. And when I say expensive, I usually mean time consuming, but it's super important, especially for morale, which these days, you know, when we're trying to all retain our great employees is a tough one. I think the other thing that people forget about is the OSHA general duty clause. Well, OSHA has lots of really specific laws and rules about things like powered industrial trucks. There's this little catch clause that everybody, not everybody, people often forget about that basically says you as an employer have an obligation, no matter what, to identify hazards in your space and protect, help your help work with your employees to protect them from harm. You know, and, and I think that while a lot of people get frustrated about that, it sends a really important message, which is that, hey, you, we're all responsible for each other's well-being. Right. And as an employer, you have a slightly larger burden. You know, part of OSHA's setup is that the employer is responsible to identify the hazard and train and provide safety equipment and, and, and ways to get around it. The employee is also required to do their part, which is to pay attention during the training. Um, but I think sometimes that we fall short as trainers, or at least this has been my challenge over the years, to make sure that we're actually checking the accountability of that work, right? To say, hey, you know, are, did you understand what I taught you? And then, of course you know, it's always accountability, right? Watching our employees work and, and, and it's difficult as in a small brewery where we're all close and have a family vibe to stop somebody and say, Hey, you know, you know better than to walk through the space in flip flops while we're running CIPs or to bring a tour back or to lean that A-frame ladder against a fermenter. You know, that, I, I think it's important to, to think about those things, even if you're really small and hopefully the tools that, Zach's group has out there will make some of that a little less painful. I will, I will add to that and just say, I got my copy of Matt Stinchfield's book yesterday. Um, it's, it is amazing. I, I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I have thumbed through it and, and looked at some of the information that's in there. Um, 
And I don't think there's a book out there that covers safety for breweries at this level of detail that I've ever seen before. I think, you know, if, if there's one recommendation to come out of this, it's it's if you're running a brewery, buy that book and and share it with your team. Um, and then the other thing I, I wanted to say is um, the videos, the safety training videos, which are available to everybody. You don't have to be a member of the BA to access those. Those are fantastic. And for our first four years at New Realm, we use those religiously for our safety training. They're uh, specifically tailored to a brewery operation. They're wonderful videos. It gets discussion going among the team. They see a lot of things that may be happening in, in your brewery and, and point those out. It's just just a, a really good time investment and investment in your team and your employees. So anyway, that's me championing that and, little bit of safety. <laughs> and, and when they complete the courses, they get certificates. So Zach gets his, uh, Zach gets his log book. <laughs> um, we're, I, I heard, uh, I heard Zach and you can confirm this. It sounds like there's some appetite to actually update those videos a little bit. There was some concern about the fashion sense of a few of the, <laughs> yeah. the older videos. <laughs> yeah, we, we're working on uh, on updating those a little bit. That's going to be a little further down the line. Um, but we, we're moving towards kind of a, a new format, like a hosting format for the videos. Um, I can't remember if that's live for everyone yet or not, but it's going to be coming up. And it's a more engaging and kind of, more exciting way to go through the content than just watching a, a 12 minute video on bottling safety. It breaks it up in a more fun, digestible way. So yeah, it's gonna be some, some cool stuff coming from that. It's, it's exciting to see all that stuff manifest, right? Also, uh, you know, some of my employees have fussed at when I sit, when I make them sit and watch the videos and I'm like, would you rather listen to me talk for, for 14 hours? <laughs> <laughs> Because if you think the video is boring, wait till I get going. Yeah. <laughs> can can you limit that to fourteen hours? If I work, I gotta sleep. I gotta sleep yeah. more than I oh, used okay. to. Okay. Right? Got it. <laughs> Um, you know, a couple of things I wanted to point out. So, Larry, thank you for bringing up the draft cleaning safety. Um, mm -hmm work that you you all have done uh we had an incident just a couple of weeks ago in our brewery where we bring in an outside firm to clean our draft lines and they did not purge them out properly and so one of our brewers got a mouthful of cleaning solution and was scared to death that he was going to die and um you know we uh we were able to get the uh uh, uh the material safety sheet uh the data sheet and and take him to the emergency room with that in hand and he's all okay but it was quite scary and and we had actually gone through that training with some of our staff but you know when you bring in outside people to do this kind of work you got to verify right you got to verify that they're doing it properly and and you know with draft cleaning services i see employment ads for those all the time so there's apparently a lot of turnover in that business so <laughs> just something uh, to keep your eye on if you're bringing people in to clean your lines i do find it entertaining that you know <laughs> as, as brewers we mostly clean stuff right yeah we buy things <laughs> and we clean things uh, and and ship stuff and and that's basically a cleaning job right <laughs> nobody in my brewery wants to clean the draft lines either and i'm like we all know how important that is you know i'd like to take a uh, maybe some shelfless or selfless uh, self-promotion and reach out to any brewers that are trained engineers or macgyvered engineers uh we could certainly use some uh, additional members to the uh, maintenance and engineering subcommittee so if uh, if you know how to fix stuff or uh, or think you do, we certainly would like to hear from you. Yeah, shame. That's a that's a great spot for the shameless plug of you two can volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there, I believe there's a, a link in the resource hub to email the Brewers Association. Uh, if not, uh, use the contact form. Uh, it will get routed to the right staffer who will absolutely find a spot for you to help us yep absolutely all right anybody have anything else just just, just a... 
Uh, Sorry, I made I made this whole crew watch while I walked into the kitchen and got a beer. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I, I think that about wraps it up, right? We're almost out of time. Um, I appreciate everybody who gave this a listen and, and thanks to my, my uh, colleagues in the technical committee for being here tonight. Um, you know, we're doing a, a, a lot of work that we all feel very passionate about and hopefully, uh, you know, some folks who are listening in can take advantage of it and take a look and see what we're doing and help us out if, if you can. And, you know, just uh, we're all here to help make everybody better. Right. You know, and um, you know, whether it's safety, quality, um, just running a brewery, running an operation, running a sustainable operation, all of that's so important. So yeah, thanks everybody. And uh, we'll catch you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah.